bringing a close to this series that I've been uh, sharing with you on anxiety. Uh, we've been camping out, obviously, in Philippians chapter 4, but as we talked about this subject, we're going a little bit deeper now into this fourth chapter of Philippians, Paul's letter to a church in Philippi. And as a result, we're kind of expanding now this discussion about what it means to be somewhat anxiety-free. And the passage that I'm using today is Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And it reminded me that when mariners describe a tempest that no sailor can possibly escape, they call it a perfect storm. Not perfect in the sense of ideal, <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination, but perfect in terms of it being a combination of a number of factors. All the elements, such as hurricane force winds, a cold front, a downpour, all these things work together to create this insurmountable disaster. Now, the winds alone would be a challenge. But the winds, plus the cold, plus the rain, well, the perfect recipe exists there for a disaster. But you know, you don't have to be a fisherman to experience the perfect storm. All you need is a layoff, plus a recession, or a disease, plus a job transfer, or a relationship breakup, than finding out that the college has rejected you for admission. You know, we can handle one challenge, it seems, but two or three all at the same time, it's just like this one wave after another. These gale force winds blowing into our lives, then followed by thunderstorms on top of that. It's enough to really make you wonder, how will I ever survive? And Paul's answer to that question is actually pretty profound, and it's very concise. It's Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. When Paul penned that section about being anxious for nothing, he had just recently endured a storm of his own on the Mediterranean Sea. On his final recorded voyage that we have in the book of Acts, Paul was placed on a ship in Caesarea Philippi bound for Rome, Italy. And the ship had enjoyed very smooth sailing until they reached this port called Sidon. At the next stop, was another port called Myra, and they changed ship. So they offloaded all the passengers, all the crew, and all the gear from the one ship onto a much larger Egyptian grain ship. Now these Egyptian grain ships were huge. Think of them as being somewhat like aircraft carriers. They are 100 feet long. They weighed perhaps more than even 1,000 tons. And the ships were really super sturdy. But they were engineered in such a way that they really didn't travel well into the wind. So it's no surprise then, as we read through this narrative in Acts, that with winter now fast approaching, they reached this nearby port, Nidus, with a lot of difficulty. And from there, they sailed south under the island of Crete to try and use the island as a barrier to all these winds until they reached the port of Fair Haven. And as an aside, Fair Havens wasn't so fair. It was like the Chamber of Commerce calling it Fair Havens, but there was nothing fair about it, and the sailors did not want to stay in Fair Haven because it was an ugly place to stay. There was nothing for them to do, and they would rather travel on to another port. So they knew they couldn't reach Rome before winter, 
but they did prefer this port called Phoenix as opposed to Fair Haven. Now, Paul tried to convince them otherwise, and Paul was no stranger to storms at sea or even shipwrecks because you can read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, about his experience with those disasters. He knew the danger of a winter voyage, and he issued a really strong caution to the captain. But in the eyes of the captain, the pilot of the ship, Paul was just a Jewish preacher. In fact, he was a prisoner. He was being transported to Rome. So they weighed anchor and set sail for a better harbor. You can find all this out in Acts chapter 27, verses 1 through 12. Here's verse 14. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurocliden. And it's interesting that the writer of Acts, Luke, he's a doctor, is using the more formal term for this wind called Eurocliden. And it's a compound word. And interestingly, it takes part of a Greek word and part of a Latin word. The Greek word is euro, and that refers to an east wind. The Latin word is aquilo, and that refers to a north wind. So what Luke is trying to describe here is a condition in the weather that people affectionately refer to as Eurocliden. And for us today, we would call it a nor'easter. This is the kind of storm that was now coming upon them. The temperature drops, the sails whip, the waves froth, and at this point in time, the sailors are searching for land and can't see it. They are looking at the storm, and they can't avoid it. The components of the perfect storm are now beginning to gather. A winter sea, a ferocious wind, a cumbersome boat, and a very impatient crew. Individually, if one of these things had happened, that was probably manageable. But collectively, combining them all together, it was impossible. Those odds of them succeeding are formidable. So the crew did what they could. They literally hoisted the lifeboat into and aboard the ship, and then they frapped it. They tied everything down is what frapping means. So they tie everything down. They lower the sea anchor, and they start jettisoning all the cargo, including equipment. They just throw it overboard. But nothing works. And if you continue in Acts chapter 27, verse 20, it reads like a death sentence. Because here's what it says. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. The perfect storm, you see, had taken its toll on this crew, and it lasted for two weeks. Now, 14 hours would probably shake anybody. Frankly, 14 minutes would probably have me shaky. But can you imagine being in this storm for 14 days, just going on and on and on, sunless days and starless nights, 14 days of bouncing up and down in this cargo ship, climbing toward the heavens, then plunging down to the depths of the ocean. The ocean is booming and splashing and rumbling. I mean, the sailors were so sick, they lost their appetite. These are seasoned men. This is all they do, and they are so scared, they've lost their appetite. And then they lost all reason to hope of getting out alive. So they gave up. And when they gave up, interestingly, Paul speaks up. Here's what he says in verses 21 and 22. Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. But now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. 
That's quite a contrast. Here you have seasoned mariners, sailors, who know how to sail in storms, and they've given up all hope. And here's Paul, a Jewish preacher, who presumably knew very little about sailing. And he now becomes the courier of courage to a crew who is so upset they've lost their appetite and they've lost their zest for life. What did Paul know that these guys didn't? Better question, what did Paul say that you and I need to hear? Like the sailors, some of us are bouncing around in our own nor'easter. Circumstances come at us from all angles. And it seems like there is no way to escape from the problems that we presently find ourselves in. One thing might be enough, but several piling on all at the same time, it's the perfect storm. It's the nor'easter in our life. It's something where we would give up hope. And like the sailors, maybe you've done all you can to survive. You've tightened up the ship, and you've lowered your anchor, so to speak. You've consulted the bank. You've changed your diet. You've called the lawyers. You've called your supervisor. You've tightened your budget. You've gone for counseling or for rehab or for therapy, yet the sea of your life just churns away with its angry foam. And the question that is being raised by Paul, and I'm asking you today, as I do myself in writing these lessons, is fear coming at you from like all angles? Are you in a set of circumstances now or do you anticipate circumstances in the future where everything is all piling on you at the same time? If that's the case, then let God speak to you. Let God give you what he gave the sailors. And that was a perfect peace. Interestingly, Paul first begins, as some of you chuckled, with a rebuke. Men, you should have listened to me. Now, like a lot of good a rebuke is going to do when you're just about ready to toss your cookies after being in two weeks of a storm, right? But for whatever reason, Paul stands up and says, y'all should have listened to me. Now, we don't like to be rebuked, do we? We don't like to be chastened. We don't like to be corrected. And neither do our kids. But that doesn't prevent us as parents from occasionally correcting, rebuking, reminding our children during the appropriate time. So when we ignore God's warnings, a scolding is in order for his kids too. For instance, are you in some sort of storm of anxiety because you didn't listen to God? He told you that the borrower is a slave to the lender, but you took on this enormous and dangerous debt. He told you to cherish your spouse and nourish your children. And you, you cherished your career and you nourished your vices. He cautioned you about the wrong crowd, or the strong drink, or the long hours, but you just didn't listen. And now, you're in a storm of your own creation. And if this describes you, then you ought to receive God's rebuke. He corrects the kids that he loves, and he loves you desperately. So, if you're in some sort of a storm that is of your own creation, then stand corrected, confess your sins, resolve to do better, be much smarter the next time, would you? Because while this story contains a rebuke, you can take encouragement because this story also contains three promises 
that can give us all peace in the middle of our storm. The first promise is that heaven has helpers to help you. If you read Acts chapter 27, just verse 23, it says, there stood by me this night an angel. So on the deck of a sinking ship in the middle of a raging storm, Paul receives this visitor from heaven. An angel came and apparently stood beside him. And church, angels still do it. This isn't something that's just interesting historically. Angels still do. All the angels are spirits who serve God and are sent to help those who will receive salvation. That's what the Hebrew writer said in the Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Angels are sent to help those who are to receive salvation. If you are a person to receive salvation because you have committed yourself to Jesus Christ, then you're the person to whom angels are going to be sent. The prophet Daniel experienced this. He had the assistance of angels. At one point in time, he was extremely troubled. He resolved to pray for his nation. And after three weeks, Daniel received an answer. And you're thinking, well, that's fine. I'd kind of like them my answer now. I want to pray and I want to see results, God. And I'm sure Daniel was frustrated. It didn't prevent him from praying. He kept praying. But it took three weeks to get the answer until you find out why. Because the moment that Daniel began praying, the answer was sent. However, demonic forces blocked the pathway of the angel that had been supplied with God's reply. And this impasse lasted for a full three weeks until finally God sent the angel, uh, Michael, the archangel. He arrived on the scene, and he has the superior authority, and the standoff was ended, and the prayer was answered. And it raises the question, because this happens in my life too, church, have your prayers from time to time been met with a silent sky? Have you prayed and heard nothing? And are you floundering now in this tempest, in this nor'easter, in this perfect storm, in this land between this offered prayer and your request for an answer to that prayer? If so, church, don't give up. What the angel said to Daniel, God says to you. In Daniel, the Old Testament book, chapter 10, verse 12. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. Daniel offered the prayer. It was heard. He didn't receive the answer for some time, and we now have an explanation as to why. And there could be times in our lives when we offer prayers and we just don't ever seem to get an answer. And I can't tell you why, but it sounds to me, given what we have in Daniel, that there's some forces going on that attempt to interfere with God's answer to that prayer. So don't give up. You've been heard in heaven. Angelic armies have been dispatched. Reinforcements have been rallied. God promises in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 25, I will contend with him who contends with you. So just do what Daniel did, church. Remain before the Lord. But the second promise is that heaven has a place for you. And Paul knew this because that same verse, Acts chapter 27, verse 23, says, For there stood before me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong. Now, here's an example. When parents send kids, let's say, to a summer camp, and I've done that in the past, you have to sign a lot of documents. Most of them, releases of liability. But it's basically some Q&A about if something happens, who is going to be the responsible party? 
if Johnny breaks his arm, or if Susie breaks out in measles, who will be responsible? And hopefully, you hope a mom or a dad or them both are signing on. They will be responsible. You know what? I've got great news for you. God has signed up to be responsible for you. When you gave your life to him through his son, Jesus Christ, he took responsibility for you. He guarantees your safe arrival at his port. You are his sheep. He is your shepherd. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. John chapter 10, verse 14. You are his child. He is your father. You are no longer a slave, but God's own child, Paul writes to the church in Galatia. And since you are his child, God has made you an heir. Galatians chapter 4, verse 7. So you can have peace in the midst of your storm because you're not alone. You are God. And the third promise is that you're in the Lord's service. Going back to this same passage, Acts chapter 27, verse 23. For there stood before me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. See, God had given Paul an assignment. Paul's assignment is... I want you to carry the gospel to Rome. Paul had not yet arrived at Rome, so God wasn't finished with him. And since God wasn't finished with Paul, Paul knew he would survive. Now, most of us don't have real clear messages like that from God, but we do have assurances that we will not live one day less than we're supposed to live. If God has work for you to do, he will keep you alive to do it. Psalm 139, verse 16 says, All the days planned for me were written in your book before I was one day old. Now, I'm not saying that you're not going to have any more problems in the future. Quite the contrary. Sadly, Paul had his share. And church, you are going to have your share too. But I want you to take a look at verse 22. Acts chapter 7, 27, verse 22. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Church, that's a problem. The ship is going to be destroyed. It's not easy to lose, and that sustains, and that protects and supports you. Your boat is maybe your marriage, or your body, or maybe your business. Because of your boat, you've been able to stay afloat. And now, without your boat, you think that you will sink. And you will. For a while, the waves are going to sweep over you. Fear is going to suck you under like a Pacific riptide. But take heart, says Paul, and take heart, says Jesus Christ. In John chapter 16, verse 33, in this world, you will have trouble. But be brave. I have defeated the world. You see, you can lose it all only to discover that you haven't lost anything because God has been there all along. God has never promised a life without storms. But he has promised to be in the storms when they come. A little boy named Noah Drew can tell you that. And I'll conclude with this story. He was only two years old when he discovered the protective presence of Jesus. The Drew family was making a very short drive 
from their house to their neighborhood swimming pool. But Noah's mom was driving so slowly that the locks did not engage in the van that she was driving that contained Noah. Unfortunately, a precocious little two-year-old Noah opens the door and falls out of the van. Mom feels a bump as if she had driven over a speed bump and breaks quickly to a stop. Noah's dad jumps out of the car and finds Noah on the pavement. He's alive, Ben shouted and placed him on the seat. Noah's legs are covered in blood and he's shaking violently. And mom hurries over to the passenger seat to hold Noah while dad gets in the driver's seat to drive them to the emergency room. And incredibly, the tests on Noah show that no bones were broken. A 5,000 pound vehicle has just run over the two-year-old's legs, yet Noah had nothing but cuts and bruises to show for it. Later that night, Noah's mom, her name is Leanna, she dropped to her knees and she thanked Jesus for sparing Noah's life. She then stretched out on the bed next to him. And he was asleep, or at least so she thought. And as she's lying beside him, in the dark, Noah says, Mama, Jesus catched me. She said, he did? Noah replied, I told Jesus thank you. And he said, you're very welcome. The next day, Noah actually gave his mom a few more details. Mama, Jesus has brown hands. He catched me like this. And he holds his arms outstretched and he cupped his little hands. The next day, he told her that Jesus had brown hair. And when she asked him for more information, he said, that's all. In this really nonchalant manner of a two-year-old. But when he said his prayers that night, he said, thank you, Jesus, for catching me. Church nor'easters are going to bear down on the best of us. Contrary winds, crashing waves, they all come. But Jesus still catches his children. He still extends his arms. He still sends his angels. Because you belong to him, you can have peace in the midst of your storm. The same Jesus who sent the angel to Paul sends this message to you and to me. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. You may be facing a perfect storm. But Jesus offers the perfect peace. It's his peace. It's not just any peace. It's God's peace. A peace that passes all understanding. And as Paul writes to the church in Rome, in Romans chapter 11, verse 34, who can understand the mind of God? When you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. In church this week, if you find yourself in a nor'easter, just know that God promises to be with you in that storm. And as difficult as it might be able for you to see your Jesus, trust that he's there. Because like little Noah, he'll catch you. We don't know why trials come into our lives. Many times we've been told that sometimes these trials are intended to develop us and mature us. And we know growing from children to adults, it's sometimes not easy to grow into maturity. Sometimes we have to learn the hard way. How many times did your mom or your dad tell you, I don't think that's a really good idea. Oh, you don't know anything, and you go off and you do it, and then sure enough, 
mom and dad is right. They might even rebuke you, like Paul did to the sailors. But the truth of the matter is, mom and dad only told you that and gave that information to help you avoid a disaster. But you got into it, but mom or dad, they're still there at the end because they love you. And in the same way, so is God. He loved you so much, he sent his son Jesus to to die for each of you and me. Because without that sacrifice, we don't have a chance of eternity with God. But with Jesus, we do. And because of that sacrifice, then we can live with God eternally. So if he loves you that much, do you really honestly believe that during the hard moments in your life, he's just going to say, oh, well, can't work with that one, and punt you down the football field of life. No. He's going to be there in your storm. And it might seem like you're drowning, but you won't because he loves you. So we're going to sing this song that's designed to kind of bring out this idea of this perfect peace that we've been talking about. And this week, I would encourage you to rather than staring in the face of your storm, reach out for the hand of Jesus and see if that doesn't change your circumstances and relieve some of your anxiety. Let's stand and see.